Welcome everyone, good morning. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Agnes and I work with the education team at the Librea Tar Pits. So as you can tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and fossils. A piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few fun facts you've learned or draw or write a description of what the fossil looks like. We love fan art of our fossils here at the museum. So if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, you're welcome to e send it to your teacher and they can email it to us at the school programs team. So this is the animal we're featuring today and one that many of you may be familiar with. So this animal was living here in Los Angeles 11 to 55,000 years ago during the Pleistocene Epoch or the last ice age. And today we're looking at the saber-toothed cat. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure you're all dying to meet Sean and the cat. So I'm going to switch our camera over to Sean so we can meet today's Ice Age animal and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi there, Sean. Hello. Hi, everybody out there. Uh, thank you, Agnes, for introducing me. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, saber-toothed cats found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, the first image that we're going to show you is some of the more recent finds. So unfortunately, I really wanted to do this presentation on site and show you some of the deposits that we're working in and then show you some of the actual physical fossils. But due to COVID, I have to work from home and only go in in case of emergencies. So today I did a kind of a collage of images of recent finds that we found at La Brea. So um, the top left, we have a juvenile, uh, which just means young, um, saber-toothed cat, uh, right maxilla with the actual canine coming out. And then next to that in the center top is a full, uh, the first one came out of box 13, which is about 32,000 years old. Um, the center top one is the saber-toothed cat skull. We found a near complete skull in box nine, which is the one that I've, uh, which is the deposit I've most currently been working on. And the radiocarbon dates that have come out of that box have been about 40 to 45,000 years old. So it's a that skull is approximately that old. Uh, you can see the canines are missing. That's pretty common, especially at La Brea, um, that the teeth actually fall out of the skull and we find them somewhere else within the deposit. So I did actually find the canines, the upper canines, the sabers of that skull in different grids and levels uh, in other spots within the deposit. Um, and then farther right, back to box 13, another large right side maxilla. You can see the eye orbit, that kind of swoosh shape at the top. Bottom left, we have a mandible or jawbone, our dentary. Uh, so it's one side and uh, you can see the, the canine and a few of the other molar teeth, uh, the carnassials, uh, the uh, slicing teeth right there. And then the bottom center, that's actually a claw. So the terminal phalanx or um, claw of a saber-toothed cat. Uh, you can see that's pretty big. That's like my whole palm that it's taking up. Um, and then the bottom right is that world famous saber tooth. That's a canine. Um, the tip of the, uh, of the crown is a little broken off, uh, but that really long canine is longer than my hand essentially. Um, and that one came out of box 13. So uh, the, the, more, the current project that we're working on with project 23, is a uh, um, excavation that happened because of the art museum next door decided to build an underground parking structure. They found 16 new fossil deposits, which got crated up. They were 15 to 25 feet underground and they boxed them up in a crane, ripped them out of the ground and put them uh, on our site where we excavate on them now. And currently we've finished eight boxes entirely and measured out tens of thousands of fossils. Um, and our current excavations are focusing on box 13 and box nine, which is where all of these fossils have come out of. And we're gonna move on in the next slide. Um, so we're gonna get a general kind of uh, context of saber tooth animals. So what is a saber tooth? So the saber tooth uh, morphology or the shapes of the canines has actually convergently evolved multiple times in geologic history. 
So we have saber tooths uh, going all the way back to the Permian with Gorgonopsins, which are in the top left. Um, and then we have uh, the, most of the saber tooths are mammals. Uh, so we have creodonts, we have nimravids, we have barbarophilids. Um, and then what's really interesting is the uh, bottom center right side um, that's actually a thylacosmilus, which is from South America. And those are metatherians, which are more closely related to marsupials. But what's really interesting about that one is that that is more closely related to like a kangaroo than it is uh, to mammals like uh, saber tooth cats, like uh, Smilodon fatalis. And then in the bottom right, that's a, a cast replica of a Smilodon fatalis saber tooth cat that we find at La Brea. And that's the one that we're gonna focus on. But I wanted to give you a general context. Uh, what's really interesting about saber-toothed cats is that uh, they're, uh, and other saber-tooths, is that it's a common thing that arises multiple times throughout uh, evolution and uh, prehistory. Uh, but we don't have any saber-tooths alive today. And all the saber-tooths were carnivores um, and they're large predators, uh, terrestrial predators that are using their upper canines and they are functional. Um, they're not just for display and they are using them to hunt and kill prey usually larger than themselves. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the next slide. So the first misconception that we wanna get out of the way is that it's not a tiger. So say we're gonna, now we're gonna focus uh, specifically on the Macherodontinae, which is um, the saber tooth cats that we find at La Brea. And so you can see the green arrow in this slide actually points to Smilodon and then Homotherium, which is on the same line. And so those are the two saber tooth cats that we find at La Brea. And uh, this is just kind of showing you a taxonomic breakdown of how uh, these are, how different cats are related to each other. And then all the way at the bottom, you can see Panthera tigris, which is the tiger. And then next to that is Panthera leo, which is the modern day lion. And those two are fairly closely related to each other, but you can see that they're separated by a lot of, uh, a lot of time um, and genetic separation from Smilodon and the saber-toothed cats. Um, so uh, the Macherodontinae separated roughly 20 million years ago, and then Homotherium and Smilodon separated from each other uh, with a common ancestor roughly 18 million years ago. Um, but the main thing that I want you to get out of this portion of the talk is just that's the saber-toothed cats, and again, they're saber-toothed cats because uh, they do fall within Felidae, uh, so the family of Felidae. You can see that, that big branch uh, of Felidae is, um, contains the Macherodontinae as well as the modern-day big cats as well. Um, but the tiger and the saber-toothed cat are separated by a lot of time, um, so they're not tigers. So we're going to move on. Uh, so Smilodon fatalis, this is the most common saber-toothed cat found at the La Brea Tar Pits. It's also known as the dirk tooth cat. That's kind of the ecomorph name for it. And so these uh, specimens have been found at La Brea since uh, the early, uh, the late 1800s. So William Denton came in 1875 and was presented with a saber-toothed cat canine uh, by the Hancock family who used to own the La Brea Tar Pit property and then eventually uh, donated it to the museum in the county. And when they presented William Dented with the saber tooth cat canine, he was the first person to realize that uh, these were actually fossil forms found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, and he published on those results, but it didn't really become common knowledge in the scientific community till the early 1900s with uh, um, Orcutt, who's a very, very famous geologist. Um, but that being said, they were finding these remains uh, much earlier than 1875. It's just William Denton was the first person to identify them as fossil remains and specifically the saber-toothed cat. Um, also, Smilodon was first found by a uh, paleontologist named Lund in Brazil in 1838. Um, he only found a few fragmented pieces, a few teeth, and a few other isolated elements, um, and he did not find the upper canines, and he actually thought they were uh, part of a hyena um, until 1842, and he discovered uh, more uh, remains, including the upper canines, and uh, found out that it was actually a cat, and then he 
determined that it was Smilodon fatalis, uh, or um, uh, the one found in um, Brazil was actually a different species of Smilodon populator. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that was found in 1838 um, and first described in 1842 as Smilodon. Um, and so for Smilodon fatalis, this is more exclusively a North American species. So you can see this little map. This doesn't actually show where all the specimens have been found Smilodon, but it's just a, a fairly good representation of a lot of the sites that have found uh, Smilodon fatalis. And you can see uh, uh, east to west, um, all the way down into Mexico and all the way up into Canada, this uh, species has a very large range. And we'll talk about it going even farther south in, in the next slide. Um, but for on this slide, we're going to also talk about um, the skeletal structure of the saber tooth cat. So you can see they have very short tails. If you look at their tail comparatively to modern day big cats like lions and other things like that. So a lot of uh, uh, big cats and even smaller cats have really long tails today. And most of the, if they are very small cats and they, they might live in trees and the, the tail helps them with balance. And then if they're on the plains and they're big cats and they're running around, the tail might help them maneuver and really get around. And so the short tail on the, on the Smilodon, scientists have interpreted that as it um, being an ambush predator. Uh, it also has a very short back. So if you look at those lumbar back, the the section of vertebrae behind the ribs. Um, that's kind of shortened comparatively to other big cats. And then it's got these really robust big arms um, and the skull is heavily modified to deal with those canines. Um, and it's a very big, heavy cat. So modern day lions, the females are over 300 pounds ish and the males are usually over 500 pounds. The saber tooth cat would have been even larger. Even the, the stature and the size would have been roughly the same as a, as a, as a modern day lion, but they're, the heaviness of the animal, the weight of the animal um, would have been much heavier. Uh, so some estimates would have put them around uh, six to 800 pounds. And then some of the largest specimens may have been even bigger than that, maybe even around a thousand pounds. So that's kind of variable depending on the exact specimen that you find um, and uh, what techniques you're using to figure out how heavy it is based off of uh, using just the bones. So obviously these animals are completely extinct. We don't have them alive anywhere today. And so we have to rely heavily on modern analogs to tell kind of uh, our best estimates on what exactly is going on and then use scientific evidence to find data and then uh, do research to figure out specifics. And so we're gonna move on in the next slide. And we actually have three different species of Smilodon. So Smilodon is completely within the Americas only. So its common ancestor came from uh, Eurasia and crossed over the Bering Land Bridge, uh, entered into North America, and then it speciated into Smilodon. Um, and the Smilodon uh, genera came about uh, and is endemic specifically to the Americas. Um, it started out with Gracilis, which is uh, the earliest Smilodon. So that actually comes about in the Pliocene, which is before the Pleistocene, which is the where La Brea um, geolo in geologic context is. Um, and so Gracilis is a little bit smaller um, and it was it's been found in Florida. And then also uh, one specimen has been found in South America as well. At, funny enough, also in a tar pit in Venezuela. Um, and uh, then we eventually get Smilodon fatalis, which is mostly in North America, but a few specimens have been found in South America. Again, there's been a few in other tar pits in like Peru and places like that, which is pretty cool. So La Brea is not the only tar pit um, in the world. There's actually a few of those. So even though it's fairly unique and we have, uh, we're the most excavated uh, fossil locality for um, tar pits in the world, there are other tar pit localities elsewhere in Central, South America, Cuba, uh, Japan, a um, bunch of other sites in Azerbaijan in the Middle East. Um, so there's a lot of different asphaltic localities in different spots. Uh, but the La Brea tar pits is uh, definitely the most famous and most researched and has the most specimens. Um, so uh, Populator, Smilodon Populator was actually the largest of the saber tooth cats and it's found exclusively in South America. And so you can kind of see that big gray blob and that's just a large distribution area where they found 
fossils of Smilodon populator. Um, so yeah, some of the estimates uh, put it at um, probably a, a quarter uh, a quarter percent larger than the Smilodon fatal. So it's, it's uh, even larger. And then the pop, uh, Smilodon populator was probably a little more adapted to open uh, environments um, than say the, the Smilodon fatalis based off of some evidence and research. Um, so the other thing about Smilodon fatalis is there's been a lot of like uh, isotope studies and research using carbon and nitrogen. And um, most of that evidence points to it being a um, C3 adapted animal that is more adapted to a closed environment. So again, an ambush predator um, it's waiting in uh, thickets and vegetation for uh, prey to come by, and then it's going to uh, ambush that prey and attack them. And then we're going to move on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Sorry. One more thing, going back to Smilodon. Um, so Smilodon fatalis, um, we have over 140,000 specimens recovered from the La Brea tar pits and with over 1,000 skulls, near complete skulls. So again, it's the second most common large animal found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, and we have over 140,000 uh, specimens recovered from pretty much every fossil locality um, on, in Hancock Park where the La Brea Tar Pits are. Um, so there's been 130 deposits excavated. About half of those actually have fossils. So uh, around that many have had Smilodon found inside, which is pretty cool. All right, now, sorry, moving on to the next one. Homotherium serum or the scimitar tooth cat. So um, this is another Macherodontinae. This is another saber tooth cat that lives um, in North America. It actually has a huge distribution. So different homotherium species um, are found in Africa, Europe, Asia. They eventually also came through the Bering Land Bridge over into North America. Um, and then homotherium serum specifically you can find in places like um, Alaska and the Yukon and in different spots of the, uh, the United States. Um, and there's been a couple specimens that have been found in South America as well. So it's a well distributed cat. Um, there's not as many uh, fossil localities of Homotherium. Okay, we're gonna, uh, we only have eight specimens found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, we have a couple canines and a few foot bones and an incisor and they were found in about four different deposits. Um, and none of those are related to Project 23. So the current excavations have not found any homotherium whatsoever, um, unfortunately. Maybe we will in the future, we have a lot more to go. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, so for homotherium, we have to focus on other fossil localities. So one of the most famous ones is Friesenhahn Cave, which is in Texas. Uh, this cave site has uh, um, articulated specimens and partially articulated specimens of homotherium. Uh, so you can see the lower uh, left image is one of those specimens, really, really well preserved material. Um, and then the, in the far right, uh, you can see that tooth, that's actually a Colombian mammoth tooth, a juvenile Colombian mammoth. Uh, and so these specific cats seem to have been at least in the Texas area in Friesenhahn Cave, hunting uh, a lot of baby Colombian mammoths and then dragging their carcasses back to the cave and feeding youngsters because they found very, very young individuals of homotherium, which is really cool for researchers because they were able to determine uh, different uh, rates of eruption from uh, all of the, the ontogenotic process, uh, which is just developmentally, when do the series of teeth erupt? They were able to determine all of that because they found such young individuals, which is really cool. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, so modern cats versus saber-toothed cats. Modern cats like lions today uh, use something called the clamp and hold bite where they'll actually usually suffocate their prey. So they'll use their upper and lower canines and go for the throat and they'll pinch uh, the throat area. And they usually don't even pierce the skin but it pinches and closes the windpipe uh, to kind of suffocate the animal. And they'll also do a muzzle bite where they'll clamp onto the nose and the mouth and try and suffocate it that way. And if for lions in particular, they're social, they, use an, uh, they live in a pride structure. So sometimes one will be on the throat and one will be on the muzzle at the same time. Uh, for the uh, saber tooth cats, because they had such large canines, they seem to have been doing something different. They're hunting and killing in a different way. 
So they're finding all sorts of different prey. So different isotopic research has determined that they ate a variety of uh, uh, animals. So they could they would have been eating bison, horses, llamas, maybe juvenile animals of uh, uh, potentially mammoths and sloths and mastons. All of those we found find at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, and so those canines would have been used uh, probably, this has been argued for over a hundred years, uh, but probably in the canine shear bite, which was a hypothesis that was brought about by one of the scientists that worked at the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, so William Ackerston, or, um, and he theorized that uh, the canines were being inserted into a soft area he actually thought it might've been uh, like the belly or hind limb area, um, but also potentially the throat area. Most scientists agree that it was most likely the throat because that's how most big cats uh, dispatch their prey today. Um, and so they're probably, they're, they have these really large, big, long necks and uh, they're long canines. And so they're pushing down the prey, uh, stabilizing them, and then using their neck muscles to insert the canines and then shear into the throat and cut massive uh, arteries and vessels and then potentially even the windpipe. And so the big difference between conical uh, cats like modern day cats and the uh, saber tooth cats is that the saber teeth were probably much more effective for taking down large prey, meaning that the kill would be very short. Uh, so the clam and hole bite can take up to 13 minutes, some studies have shown, and then it might even take longer if the animal is able to wrestle itself away and they have to start all over again. With the canine shear bite, if they can penetrate and go in with massive blood loss, uh, they were probably gone in a matter of a couple minutes or maybe even shorter. So that helps the animal take down the prey and then start to feed immediately, which would have been extremely effective when there's a large predator guild, lots of different types of predators on the landscape. Because we had American lions, saber-toothed cats, two different saber-toothed cats at La Brea, um, and then a ton of other types of uh, uh, carnivores like dire wolves and things like that. So all these would have been competing for kills. Um, and so being able to dispatch prey very quickly would have been very, very uh, successful and efficient. We're gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, so the bones and muscles, you can see the root of the tooth is going way up into the skull um, and about uh, three fifths of the canine actually erupts out of it. Um, and there would have been a big gum line um, that would have helped uh, the canine uh, for stability and then also let the no animal know uh, how far the, um, the canines actually penetrated in, which would have helped uh, for maximum penetration. And then for the mandible, we can see there's a really tiny, where that X is, that's called the coronoid process. It's really diminutive and small compared to other big cats. Um, and that's probably to allow for such a large uh, opening for the mouth or gape. Um, so scientists have been able to determine that it was probably around 100, 110 degrees that the animal could open its mouth. Um, so I actually have a skull right here and I can't open it all the way because this is a replica, but you can see it needs to open its mouth extremely wide just to uh, even insert something in between its lower canines and its upper canines. Um, so the degree would have been around 100 degrees, which is very, very large. Modern day cats like lions are around 60 to 70 degrees. That's how wide they can open their mouths. Um, and then the muscles, you can see the blue muscles are the masseter and temporalis muscles. These are uh, bite force as well as uh, chewing muscles. And so um, these have changed dramatically um, within uh, the saber tooth cats versus the modern day cats. And then you can see the orange uh, farther back. Those are neck muscles, very, very large and they connect to the skull through the mastoid process and all sorts of stuff. So there's a lot of different researchers and scientists out there that have uh, conducted all sorts of studies and analyses. Um, and most of them agree that the uh, large neck muscles are extremely important for pushing in the canines and the bite force would have been slightly weakened, but once it can close its mouth, um, the, uh, it would have been able to finish the shearing bite into the throat. And we're gonna move on to the next Slide. And Sean, I just want to say that um, we are going to run out of time in a few minutes. So I definitely want to get to some questions. Okay. Um, do you want to just talk super briefly about the next couple of slides? Yeah. So this is just an x-ray showing how uh, robust the arms are. So if you look at the circles, uh, the left side is a jaguar and the right side is a saber tooth cat. And you can see the black circle is much wider. And that just shows you how thick 
and big and strong the saber tooth cat is because it needs to hold down its prey so that when it inserts its canines, it doesn't break its teeth because the canines are really long. And so they're uh, under certain forces they could break uh, easier than a conical tooth. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, there's not a lot of tracks that have been found of big cats um, in the fossil record. Um, fairly recently, um, they were actually able to find uh, tracks of, of Smilodon populator in South America, um, which is really cool. Um, but at the Liberia Tar Pits, we don't find trace fossils like, uh, like footprints, or at least we haven't yet. Um, so that is not an option for us, but it's just really cool because it's another way of finding a different type of fossil uh, to see how these animals uh, really existed and kind of walked and ran through the, their environment. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, lots of aggressive behavior. Um, so this is a study that came out that's a little bit debated, but um, scientists in South America, again, found puncture holes in the top of the skulls of Smilodon populator. And they uh, think that it was actually conspecific aggression, which just means it was Smilodon on, on um, interaction. And so big cats fight all the time over territory and things like that. So potentially uh, these are examples of the canines inserting into the skull. And they actually have, some of them actually have healing um, evident. And then moving on to the next slide, um, the old and the broken. So a big uh, topic is, is Smilodon social. So some scientists, uh, many scientists say yes, and some scientists say no. Um, and that is based off of different evidence. And unfortunately, there's evidence kind of pointing in both directions. So uh, one big point of evidence that people have been bringing up for a very long time is pathological specimens. So there's over 5,000 pathologic, which just means that bones show evidence of disease or injury that have healed. Um, they had enough time to heal and it uh, didn't kill them immediately. Um, and usually if there's healing going on, uh, it means that uh, it had enough time to get to be healed and it could still find water and still find prey. Um, and so some scientists have interpreted all of the pathological specimens found at La Brea saying that there must've been some sort of uh, social hierarchical structure and that old and broken Smilodon could have been uh, uh, scavenging or being left scraps from um, other individuals that uh, were within their pride or their social structure or whatever exactly it was. Um, other scientists disagree and say that these could be explained um, by just the animals being fairly resilient over time. Um, and then another line of evidence that kind of points in the other direction is in modern day lions, the male is much bigger than the female. The male is around 500 pounds, the female is around 300 pounds-ish. Um, in saber-toothed cats, they find a little bit of sexual dimorphism. The males seem to be a little bit bigger, but it's minimal to negligible. Um, so the fact that they aren't very uh, separated by size and weight is a line of evidence saying, oh, maybe these are solitary creatures and not social. So this debate kind of rages on, but um, uh, and it kind of goes both ways. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for Q&A. Sorry for going a little over. <laughs> And just while we're waiting, I'm going to show off this skull. So this is a cast replica of a real, real specimens that were found at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, so these were found like around 100 years ago. Okay, wonderful. Sorry about that. I couldn't find my unmute button. It shifted when I stopped sharing my screen. Um, fascinating. I love the big cats. I love the saber tooth cats from La Brea. I think they're amazing and probably one of our most iconic animals that we find. So we do have a couple of questions, Sean. Thank you for that presentation. That was amazing. Um, so you did mention that it's the second most common animal we find at the tar pits. Um, and you said we have over a thousand skulls. So presumably these animals are not found all together when you excavate them. So you have to put them together. Um, and Angel wants to know, how do you do that? How do you assemble those fossils if you have all those little pieces? Yeah, so exactly. When we're excavating, we're usually finding isolated bones kind of all mixed together with all the other things. So at La Brea, we have around 660 different species of plants and animals and other types of organisms. And um, the soft tissues have completely decayed and rotted away. And within the deposits, everything's kind of mixed together. And so they're kind of interlaced and overlapped on top of each other. And when we've been able to find a specific individual, um, they, it's been dispersed uh, 
both horizontally and vertically within the deposits. So there's a lot of movement that has changed the position of these bones. Um, so that being said, after we excavate them out, uh, if we can determine that it's one individual because there's an MNI, so minimum number of only one, we're more uh, sure that it's probably one individual versus for dire wolves, I like all the excavators that work at La Brea, we usually find, you know, multiple like six, seven, eight uh, dire wolf skeletons based off of their minimum number of uh, individuals. Um, so we can't usually, if they're all about the same age and the same size, we can't really figure out which bone belongs to which individual. Um, in the past, so all, almost all the mounts that are inside our museum at the La Brea Tar Pits, those are kind of Frankenstein or composite skeletons. So they took the same species, but they took different elements uh, that might have been separated by thousands of years from different individuals, but they're about the same size. Um, and then they put the put all the bones together to make one skeleton so that the general public can view what the skeleton would have looked like. So as Nancy was saying, it's kind of like a puzzle, right? You have to yeah, it's very much like a puzzle. So yeah. one, one is a puzzle trying to get figure out how to excavate everything out, and one's a puzzle to how to represent and show it to the general public. Okay. And you um, talked a little bit about the hunting style of these big cats. So during the Ice Age, if there was the Smilodon and the Panthera atrox or other big cats going after the same food source, would they fight each other? Do we have any evidence of that? And if so, um, who would win? <laughs> That's a tough one, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that it did happen. Um, I don't know if we actually have any physical evidence uh, that is uh, that can for sure say this definitely happened. But um, in all likelihood, if we look at places like modern day Africa with a lot of different types of big cats, whenever they stumble into each, each other's territories, they're uh, constantly getting into uh, battles and fights usually trying to just display um, and intimidate and scare off and run away. But sometimes it does escalate into um, actual lethal fighting. So this probably was uh, true um, at the La Brea Tar Pits as well, because we have all those. So we have the American lion, Panther Aatrox. We have uh, saber tooth cats like uh, Smilodon, Fatalis, Somatherium, Serum. We also have jaguars. We also have pumas or mountain lions. Um, so all these cats would have been around the area um, and at slightly different times, potentially, um, but interactions between some of them probably did happen. And potentially if these are carnivore traps and something like a baby mastodon or a baby mammoth or a bison or a horse gets trapped at the La Brea tar pits um, and then it makes distress calls, the uh, predators are going to come. And so there was actually a big study uh, using callbacks. Uh, so they went to Africa and they uh, set up like a stereo system and played distress calls from an herbivore. And they did a study to see what animals would show up first. And it was mostly the social creatures. So this is another line of evidence for La Brea for Smilodon being social. So they took the numbers that they found in their playback study and then they compared it to the amount of carnivores that are found in different numbers at La Brea and the amount of Smilodon fatalis that we find that points to it potentially being social as well. But again, it's thousands of years and everything's mixed together. So other scientists disagree and say, well, you can't actually determine whether or not all of those smiling on went into that deposit at the same time, or if they were hundreds or thousands of years apart. So, mm, yeah. Wait, that kind of uh, something question. that, yes, you did. And something you um, called back to from earlier is, Something that we do that you, you do is look at modern day animals and do comparisons because, as you mentioned, Smilodon's extinct. Right. Their Aatrox extinct. So we can look at modern day behavior and compare that. So we have time for one last question. Thank you, everybody, for hanging around. I know we've gone a little over, but it's fascinating. And Sean is filled with knowledge he wants to share with everybody. Um, so one last question. You mentioned the, the, um, the tar pits in Venezuela. So one of our, um, one of our, Guess wants to know if you've ever been to any other tar pits around the world and what are they like? Are they different from the La Brea tar pits? Yeah, um, so I haven't unfortunately been to Venezuela to go to those tar pits. Um, I, the only other tar pits that I've been to personally are other tar pits in California. So La Brea is not actually the only tar pit in California. We also have Carpinteria, 
um, which is a fossil bearing locality that is also an asphalt seep or tar pit. And then there's also the McKittrick uh, tar seeps and uh, deposits that also have fossils. And then there's even still modern um, uh, oil and asphalt coming up to the surface in those localities and other localities in Southern California, like in Ojai and other, thing, other places like that. Um, so I've been to those places, but I have not been to Central and South America and Cuban and, uh, and Azerbaijan tar pits. I hope to do that someday. And actually, uh, one of our curators, Dr. Emily Lindsay, uh, she's been to, she did uh, her dissertation on tar pit localities in South America. And she's been to the Talara uh, pits and she's been to Tonke Loma. And these are places in like Peru and Ecuador and places like that. Um, and one of the sites that uh, Dr. Emily Lindsay has visited was seemingly actually a bone bed of giant ground sloths. And then the asphalt secondarily came up and surrounded the fossil remains after they had already been buried. So at the La Brea tar pits, most of our fossils seemingly, uh, the asphalt seeps up all the way to the surface and then the, it collects things and then uh, sediments deposit over that. And then the asphalt percolates through all that and then it happens over and over and over again. Um, and we get these really large, big uh, conical shaped deposits that have tons of different organisms all uh, trapped inside. At uh, uh, the site that Dr. Emily Lindsay went to, uh, the bone bed seem seemingly was already buried and it was a bunch of wallowing ground sloths, probably in a watering hole. And then the asphalt percolated into the remains after they were already deposited. So it's very, very different than uh, the La Brea tar pits, even though it still has asphalt and it still has fossils. That's great, thank you. Um, and that's what makes us so special, right? We're such a unique site in the world with so many fossils that are discovered. Um, thank you, Sean, for taking the time to um, chat with everybody today and share your knowledge of Save Tooth Cat. That was amazing and we appreciate it. Um, so I am going to wrap it out, share my screen. Um, and uh, thank you to our friends and our students for joining us this morning. We learned so much about Save Tooth Cats. If you want to see more of our fossil preparation preparators, Give them a follow on Instagram at Lobrea Tarkets. And we'll also have all these videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can watch this recording and others at youtube.com slash Tarkets. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you again, Sean, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.